Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Tom Maroney. I'm with Shell in the upstreams business, exploration and production in the deep water line of business, work out of New Orleans. So again, it's a pleasure to be here this morning at the uh, ARC Industry World Forum. And this morning, over the next 20 to 30 minutes, I want to take you on our journey uh, that's been going on for about the last five to seven years inside of our deep water business. And it's a journey on how we're using analytics to really transform how we conduct our engineering and operational surveillance to ensure that these massive integrated production systems that sit out in the Gulf of Mexico and down in Brazil are optimized at any one moment in time and that we're always safely producing hydrocarbons to consumers. All right. And there is the protection slide that'll keep me out of jail. So we, now that we got that covered, move into some of the content. All right, so the way we've got the, uh, way I have the, the um, presentation laid out here, I'm going to give you a little perspective on Shell, what our business in the deep water looks like. Then we'll get into the actual exception-based surveillance capability, the analytics capability, how we built that out, uh, what it actually delivers for us in the deep water, how it been operationalized, some of the results that we've seen to date, and we'll talk a little bit then about our journey forward. So Shell, obviously a major integrated oil company uh, with activity in over 70 countries, 90,000 employees. We produce approximately 3.3 million barrels a day. And again, the business is split into the upstream and downstream. And the journey that I'm going to describe is a journey that we've begun in our upstream business, but it's something that is going to be enterprise wide. So it's going to cover both upstream, downstream, and midstream uh, as well. And it is really part of an enterprise vision that we call our smart solutions platform. It is all about how we consume data and how we make that data available all the time to the end users, end users to the operational and engineering personnel. Much like Stephen Jobs uh, created the inflection point in smart devices and how we interact with and consume, well, it began with iPods and music, right? But it now has transformed with iPads, iPhones, not only musical information and data, but a whole wealth of information. And that's what we're trying to do with our smart solutions uh, vision inside of Shell. It underpins our overall competitive analytics strategy. And you see here a chart that looks at what the advantage scales on the y-axis, and then the levels of sophistication on the x-axis. So it starts with some very basic reporting, queries. You know, that type of uh, technology has been around for decades. The exception-based surveillance capability that we've implemented in the deep water really positions us in the realm of descriptive and diagnostic analytics. It sets up a fantastic foundation to enable predictive and prescriptive analytics. So again, we see this as a, as a, uh, as a journey, as a, uh, as, as a continuous journey that is going to, again, transform how we manage and operate our production systems in the upstream and then all of our downstream operations as well. So deep water. Shell has been a pioneer in the deep water for over 40 years. This shows a number of our deep water installations dating back to the late 70s. And is there a pointer here? There isn't. Oh, there is. Yeah, so there we go. So, so you see, um, again, the, the, our, our deep water uh, technical uh, expertise, how it's unfold, uh, unfolded over the last 40 years. Uh, the two most recent, recent installations in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the Perdido and Olympus Mars B tension leg platform, and I'll give you a few statistics on those in a minute. But this is the breadth of our operation in, uh, in the Americas. So again, a lot of it uh, sits in the Gulf of Mexico, where we've got seven floating structures, four fixed structures, and, and then down in Brazil, off of Rio, we've got two floating production systems. So approximately 200 wells producing several hundred thousand barrels of oil a day, several hundred million cubic feet.
feet of natural gas a day. So a tremendous operation, right? Complex operation, complex subsurface that has to be understood in real time. The level of complexity in these systems has grown. The amount of instrumentation that, that has been put in place, things like uh, PI tags. So I think our most recent SPAR, Perdido, has well over 20,000 PI tags that is sensing vibration, pressure, temperature, flow rates, et cetera, minutes, seconds, a tremendous volume of data. How do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of that in real time? How do you know that at any one point in time that those complex integrated production systems are optimized and you know what you should be producing at the moment and what you want to produce the next day? So again, uh, the two most recent structures, the Perdido Spar, just let me quote again some of these uh, statistics. Perdido went on stream in late 2010, so it's a Spar, a very complex uh, production system, uh, subsea, seafloor separation, and then artificial lift through electrical submersible pumps, massive ESPs. Oops. Okay, and so, so you see the breadth of that operation. And then the Olympus TLP, which is, so, so again, so just some interesting facts here. So in building the Olympus TLP over the last several years, 25,000 people in 37 states, 126,000 tons, so the equivalent of 300 747s. The deck space is over 340,000 square feet, so about 15% larger than the floor of the Superdome in New Orleans. And uh, at any one point in time, there'll be well over 200 uh, personnel on board. The reservoirs that uh, w that the structure will be, w that the that the structure will pr produce from will be anywhere from two to four miles below the sea floor. And we just produced first oil from the Olympus TLP less than a week ago. So as we look forward in the deep water, our portfolio is going to continue to get more complex. It's going to be dominated by subsea developments tied back to structures such as either FPSOs or uh, spar-like structures, semi-submersibles. It's going to get complex in terms of the lifting and the boosting capabilities going to be required. The reservoirs are geologically extremely complex. The fluids are extreme high pressures, uh, high pressures, 15K, 20K production systems required. And again, all dominated, dominated by subsea tiebacks. Very complicated, technically challenging, integrated production systems. So given that, we were faced with, again, how do we create, how do we change the way we're doing engineering surveillance. How can we leverage technology, analytical technology, and move from a world where everything was dependent on who showed up at a desk and what that individual did. So it was essentially a hunting and pecking and sifting uh, exercise, looking for deviations in well performance or equipment performance. We wanted to create a capability that the equipment, that the wells, that the reservoirs were talking to us in real time, were telling us when interventions needed to happen. So that set us out on an exploration that eventually landed with this capability we refer to as exception-based surveillance. It's all based on our overall approach to how we manage our assets in the produce phase called well, reservoir, and facilities management. It's all about closed-loop decision-making understanding what that physical asset looks like, understanding what the risks, what the technical uncertainties are, what the design and operating integrity is. But essentially what we wanted was smart assets, smart wells, smart top size equipments, smart reservoirs. Then how are we going to instrument out all of that equipment? What data do we need to understand what is going on? 
Okay? The next piece is then how do we go about analyzing and optimizing? What types of models do engineers look at? What types of analytics do they eventually execute to understand when you've got something that's outside of an operating window? And eventually that's going to lead to a set of actions, perhaps some uh, uh, redesigning a piece of equipment, some de-bottlenecking. You'll update your, your, your asset diagrams and that loop will just continue on and on. We wanted to be in a position where, where we were closing that loop in a lot faster uh, time cycles than we, than we were historically, right? And if we do that, that generates just tremendous value for us in terms of not having production go offline, not having pieces of equipment uh, get taken down for repairs. So here's a little bit more on the business case as we saw it emerging. So again, as I've already described, and you had a look, increasing technical and business complex, complexity, assets just becoming much more challenging, much more harsh operating environments that we were dealing with. Uh, we heard it this morning on the opening panel about the workforce demographics. So, you know, same bimodal distribution, lots of great young folks coming in, lots of gray hairs and so forth getting ready to leave. So how do we, how, how do we extract all of that rich technical expertise that's been built up in folks with 30, 25 plus years of experience, get it cataloged so, that's, so, that's, so it is accessible by our young staff. And then the, the ways that we were working and conducting our business, again, not in a proactive manner, but very reactive, very much firefighting. We wanted to be able to put in a system where we could drive rigorous disciplined surveillance consistently across our entire asset portfolio. So here's really the, the uh, description of what exception-based surveillance is all about. Okay? It's about understanding what that operating envelope is for a well, for a reservoir, for the integrated system as a whole. Understanding then where we need to be to optimize that window and when we're beginning to track outside of those envelopes, track track outside of that sweet spot and begin to suffer production downtime. So again, the old world is, you know, this is, uh, could be a well, could be a reservoir, flow rate versus time. It would take a lot of time before the issue, the anomaly, the deviation performance would manifest itself or someone would pick up on it. So how could we actually position ourselves much earlier to understand when we were beginning to operate outside of that sweet spot. And so that's where we began this journey. So it's different than operational surveillance or some of the long cycle field uh, optimization. All right, and so we got very uh, precise about how work gets executed across a time and role continuum. All right, so looking at the kinds of activities that happen in the minutes and hours, the kinds of activities that happen in days and weeks, and the much longer cycle optimization and planning work. So we got very uh, disciplined about the language that we use. So alarms are things that happen in the operational space, all around control, safe, the safe control and monitoring of equipment. Lots of thresholds alarms requires immediate and urgent action. Alerts is something we introduced into the system. These are trends back to the operating window and the envelope. When are trends beginning to present themselves in a piece of equipment? So what is the multivariant analysis that an engineer ultimately does to understand that level of performance, that level of optimization? So those are developing and threatening conditions that if not understood and remediated, will likely wind up in lost production or a piece of equipment being taken down for an overhaul. An event is then when we need to do an action because we have an alert, and a service is the standard operating procedure we introduced so that, back to dig, uh, disciplined and rigorous, regardless of who shows up at a desk, we know that these 10 steps are going to get executed. This is a different language to introduce into the engineering space. So in the operational space, you know, this, is, this, this is how they run their operations. So we wanted to bring that level of rigor into, into this engineering space. 
And so again, exception-based surveillance is all focused on, on that space, the days to weeks to months space. It's understanding those emerging conditions and trends in equipment and well performance. So I'm going to just take you through quickly, because I see here the clock on the floor is not working. So Mark, you can you know, get the uh, hook and drag me off the stage at any point in time. So this is exactly how we set up exception-based surveillance. It started with us determining a framework of deep water conditions of interest. So these were the 15 to 20 issues that most threaten production and equipment performance. So things like uh, compressor, uh, reliability surveillance, rate and phase behavior for wells, et cetera. So we just went through and documented in our deep water portfolio what are the things that threaten production performance. We built a lean operating model. So we built, again, swim lanes, race standard operating procedures. And then how the system works is in each one of these conditions of interest, there's a defined set of data elements that come in. So these are the pieces of data that get streamed in, that get looked at, that engineers conduct models on, in or conduct their analytics on. So we automated all of that. And we defined alerts for all of the equipment types that fall into that space. The alerts then get presented on a console. We can quickly look at an alert and understand how serious it might be. How quickly is the alert come on? Or is it something that we can actually shelve and look at and investigate later? If it's something that gets turned into a service, well, then we have a standard operating procedure, a role-based workflow. That's a combination of operational, oper operational personnel and engineering personnel. These are the 10, the 8 steps that need to get done to deal with that condition of interest that is now presenting itself in a well's performance. We use a lot of lean principles, and so we make all the information available, or at least we attempt to make the information avail available. So what we wanted to prevent was people spending their time looking for information, looking for data, extracting manuals. We make it all electronic, so if they have to review a well history, look at well test performance, look at certain standardized charts, let's standardize it across the entirety of the operation so that when this issue happens, they're going to look at this. And we know it's going to happen every time. And then we track the action, we track the production impact, and we cycle back and complete that loop that I told you about. So four pillars that make up exception-based surveillance for us. The advanced alarming, the analytics engine, is foundational. It's, it's extremely important here. Uh, obviously, it starts out off with a very solid IT architecture. But that analytics engine allows us to execute some pretty complex calculations, some pretty, pick up on some pretty nuanced performance. Again, it's not just thresholds, right? We're looking at uh, rates of, uh, of change and trends, et cetera. We do a bit of workflow architecture orchestration that they just showed you. So it's rigorous and consistent. It, su it supports you know, fairly efficient uh, handoffs between personnel. So we know where work is at any one point in time in the system. Situational awareness. So we have a collaborative working environment that we call the bridge. You might have seen reference to it on a couple of slides. So again, we, we make uh, the, you know, the equivalent is the New York Stock Exchange. Someone can step into that room and get an instantaneous sense on what's going on with our deep water production system out in the Gulf, down in Brazil. And then finally, the knowledge management to deal with some of the workforce demographics, enable creation, capture, reuse, the right info, the right people, the right level of collaboration, and then really drive cross-asset learnings across all of the deep water, right? So it's not just a Mars way of doing work. If it's the best practice, then we're going to replicate it quickly across the entire portfolio. All right, this really just explains that uh, exception-based surveillance capability in a bit more detail. I want to spend a little bit of time just talking, talking you through a little bit on the analytics engine, right? So here is the analytics. Again, if it's an alarm, here's the alarm bell going off. 
you do the, uh, these are the various roles that wind up getting involved. So the, some of the statistics here, this is a typical month. So 2,000 alerts, this is how many services, this is how many actions were completed, you know, and here's this is how, much, how many of these actually translated into real value. So we're able to really sift out work that doesn't need to happen early in the process. So again, get very, very efficient in how we execute things. But just in terms of, of the analytics, right, as, as I pointed out early, you know, all of those conditions of interest are well defined. This is a compressor example. Here is the uh, analytics diagram, the process uh, calculations that go on uh, for this one condition of interest and how it ultimately leads to an alert. So just uh, for those of you who are uh, number jockeys, uh, so on any one day, we've got about 6,000 events running, okay, that we're sensing seven, uh, 17,000 pieces of equipment out in the Gulf of Mexico, okay? Those 17,000 pieces of equipment have anywhere from, uh, well, in total, uh, anywhere from 10 to 10,000 data points per day per piece of equipment, All right? So some of this data is second by second coming in. And then we do over 310,000 calculations per day. So in total, we're consuming 430 million data points per day, right? So this is all done in, in, in real time. This is all done by analytics. This, you know, a hand doesn't have to touch it, right? This is all using technology, but all the analytics are done for us. Again, it's not dependent on someone open up opening up a Pi process book or opening up an Excel sheet or a model, all of this level of analytics is happening in our business. And then what's presented to us and elevated to the engineers are the things that need to be acted on. A couple of use cases for you. Um, I'm just going to quickly put these up here and speak through them. You know, here's one on a compressor. Uh, so this was a Mars fuel gas compressor where there was an issue with a, a radial bearing vibration. Uh, the bottom line here was um, we put in, we were able to avoid a change out in equipment. Um, we did some early investigation. We wound up saving over $500,000 uh, in, in repairs. And what we actually wound up also doing was through this alert and the subsequent analysis, analysis and intervention, we identified a best practice then that we were able to replicate across all of, the, uh, all of the compressor fleet. The second one is, uh, is, is a well-related service. It's around a, a choke change, and we were able to pick up uh, that, that a well had not been restored to its, its uh, optimized choke setting. We saw back pressure being changed. We were able to go back quickly, bean up the well, and capture all of the production in that well, and not cause uh, a couple of thousand barrels a day worth of production deferment. Uh, you know, so that's just right. That's just some of the human error that, that winds up getting introduced into the operation that we're now able to avoid. The last one is a little bit uh, trickier, right? So here's where we're able to, to, to pick up on, on uh, the, uh, a restriction building, a hydrate uh, forming in a well. We were able to look at flowing bottom hole pressures. We were able to schedule some re uh, remediation in that well. We were able to line out all of the intervention activity, the equipment, plan it, and again, do it in a way where we saved money and time translating to production. So over, we've been in operation with the system since 2010, early 2010, and we've, uh, we've paid out the original investment over fourfold since then. So the proof is in the pudding, as they say. Some of the key pieces, which we already talked, spoke to, which I already spoke to on a pr prior slide, but again, just to reiterate the critical in ingredients for, for this capability for us, obviously the end elements and the data capture and the historian, the, the analytics engine is absolutely you know, essential here. The workflow engine for us, again, was able to allow us to standardize roles, have the right personnel, do the right task, not waste engineering talent on searching for information. The visual, visualization, the immersion in the visuals, situational awareness, the operational intimacy. So bringing all of the offshore 
data and creating that level of offshore intimacy in the office environment for the engineers is a safety aspect to that. We don't have to send engineers offshore as much to share their expertise. We put in a lot of technology around collaboration environments. And again, the operational or remote control. I failed to mention on that Mars B, the Olympus TLP that just went on stream, uh, that first oil that came through a West Boreas well, that well was opened up and from our remote control room onshore. So as we go forward, integrated operational cent uh, centers which have live 24-hour real-time video with the folks sitting in the Gulf of Mexico or down in Brazil, we've got that in the office. And in that case, that TLP's first oil was actually executed from the office. So where are we going in the future with analytics? A Couple of things I'll leave you with. Natural language generation. We're actually taking those conditions of interest and producing reports through some linguistics technology. Here's an example of, of what we're able to produce. So everything, I know you cannot read it, but everything in orange is text that we're producing from this technology. So standardized reports that people, that, that the information is put in context for the engineers. Huge advantage there. Okay, we're, we're looking at uh, event stream processing. All right, so, so this is a subset of complex event processing technology in the analytics space. It's about analyzing events in motion. Spectral analysis. So a lot of this stuff has got some really complex physics going on. And so to be able to detect the signals in some of those ESPs that are sitting on the seafloor, or sanding conditions when completions are breaking down in wells, we're actually seeing the benefit of using spectral analysis to extract and isolate harmonic signals in some of the uh, performance curves. In-well sensing, fiber optics, electrical-based sensing equipment, so that's just gonna have another step change, several orders of magnitude in the amount of data that's coming in. We see this as uh, extremely important uh, really driven by the complexity, geologic and reservoir complexity of the subsurface. And then the last piece is uh, continuing to move in a direction of high-end 3D graphics. In this case, trying to actually uh, overlay some of the alerts onto pieces of equipment, again, to kind of further drive the situational awareness to put the alert in context. Thank you.